Emancipation and Northern Migration focuses on the abolishment of slavery at the end of the Civil War and new challenges for African Americans. Lincoln first proposed the idea of the Emancipation Proclamation in 1862 as a war measure to cripple the Confederacy. Lincoln surmised that if the slaves in the southern states were freed, then the Confederacy could no longer use them as laborers to support the army in the fields. On the 1st of January 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation freed the African Americans in rebel states. Part of the Emancipation Declaration was that on the first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. The Emancipation Proclamation was limited in many ways. It applied only to states that had succeeded from the Union leaving slavery untouched in the loyal border states. One freedman, Houston Hartsfield Holloway, wrote, For we colored people did not know how to be free, and white people did not know how to have a free colored person about them. Even if Lincoln was not ready to admit it, blacks knew that this war was against slavery. Hundreds of thousands of slaves, freed during the American Civil War, died from disease and hunger after being liberated. Freed slaves were often negligated by Union soldiers or faced rampant disease including horrific outbreaks of smallpox and cholera. The reality of emancipation during the chaos of war often fell brutally short of that positive image. Instead, the Civil War ended slavery, but the political and economic failures of the post-war period foreclosed the possibility for true freedom and brought a new structure of racial control. African Americans suffered under Jim Crow laws in the South that segregated hospitals, hotels, railroad cars, restaurants, as well as schools. Blacks were effectively kept from voting by laws requiring a literary test. That means if you wanted to vote, you had to show you could read. As well as a poll tax, which meant you had to pay to vote. Whites were exempted from either test by a grandfather clause, which meant if your grandfather voted, you could too. Many former slaves exercised their new mobility and migrated to the cities of the North and Midwest. Their numbers did not approach those of the World War I Great Migration, but they did significantly increase the urban black population of the North. Detroit's African American population ballooned by two-thirds during the 1860s, with the vast majority of its new arrivals coming from the South. For free black Americans' life in the South was never a comfortable place. Where they lived in a slave society, where slave traders always tried to limit their numbers. After the Civil War, many Afro-Americans thought that the grass was greener on the other side and decided to migrate up north. But not everything was as they thought it would be. The north was heavily industrialized and therefore the only job opportunities were where skilled workers were needed making it difficult for the new migrants to learn new trades and find jobs. Some one million blacks had left the South, usually traveling by train, boat, or bus. A smaller number had automobiles or even horse-drawn carts. Any new arrivals found jobs in factories, slaughterhouses, and foundries where the working conditions were sometimes very dangerous. Female migrants had a harder time finding work, spurring heated competition for domestic labor positions. If we will now look at the challenges by the African Americans. After the Civil War, African Americans enjoyed a period when they were allowed to vote 
actively participate in the political process, acquire the land of former owners, seek their own employment, as well as use public accommodations. Increasingly, both white and black farmers came to depend on local merchants for credit. A cycle of debt often ensued, and year by year the promise of economic independence faded. Black and white teachers from North and South, schools, missionary organizations and churches worked tirelessly to give the emancipated population the opportunity to learn. Racist opposition to the expanding role of African Americans in society also took the form of black codes. It prohibited African Americans from serving on juries and providing legal testimony. In addition, the codes outlawed interracial marriage and created segregated public facilities. White reductance to sell to blacks and the federal government's decision not to redistribute land in the South meant that only a small percentage of the freed people became landowners. Most rented land or worked for wages on white owned plantations. Thank you for watching our video. This video was made by Callum Johnson, Michelle Gross and Jeffrey Howe.